I hope you have seen the first three tutorials that uh, are on YouTube. Uh, if you have not, I suggest that you do uh, look at them because this is a continuation of the same subject. <clears throat> In the first three chapters, I covered the Fourier series, uh, then the complex exponential, how it is applied to Fourier series, and then some information and, and details about discrete signals and how we can um, deal with them with Fourier series. In this particular video, which is the fourth one in the series, I'm going to discuss actually the Fourier transform. So previously my discussions were limited to the Fourier series, but now we're going to get to what is actually called the Fourier transform. And uh, in fact, a special transform, which is uh, um, which is usually just cursorily um, discussed in textbooks, etc., which is that continuous time Fourier transform. So let's proceed. Um, this uh, material comes from my book, which is called uh, Fourier Analysis and Spectral Estimation. It's on Amazon, and it is available. Uh, on Kindle for those of you who are not in the uh, U.S. Otherwise, it's available as a hardcover, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a nice book, if I may say so, probably the best on the subject. The material that I cover in my book <clears throat> are really a historical development of the subject, because you, for your series came first. And uh, after that came the exponential, uh, complex exponential method by which the Fourier series is uh, made somewhat mathematically easier to, to tackle. And uh, then I cover the discrete Fourier series and then uh, continuous time Fourier transform, which is a subject I'm going to cover in this particular uh, video. Um, also in the book, then I cover the uh, discrete time Fourier transform and the, uh, uh, then, then that goes into the DFT and FFT, which is really the ultimate object, that the, the tool that is used and is the one that you really need to understand. So uh, some of the acronyms that uh, I will be using and I have used in my previous tutorials are uh, when I say FA, which is the general topic of the Fourier analysis, which includes Fourier series and Fourier transform. Then there's continuous time uh, signals, which I use the acronym CT and then DT for discrete time, FT for Fourier transform, CTFT for continuous time FT, and then DTFT for discrete time Fourier series. And then comes DFT, which is a discrete Fourier transform, and then the FFT, which is a fast Fourier transform, and the letter CE for complex exponential, and FSC for Fourier series equation, and FSC for Fourier series coefficient. So a lot of um, acronyms, but hopefully uh, you'll figure them out very quickly. So the whole topic, and I'm just briefly going to go over what I covered in the first three uh, videos in case you didn't uh, see them. Um, it, it, the whole thing started uh, by an observation by Baron Joseph uh, Fourier that the solution to differential equations such as this one, and he was working on the problem of heat transfer, uh, really consisted of a, a set of harmonics that looked like this, which is there were some that you could solve this equation by a representation which was a sum of harmonic sinusoids. So the whole field of spectral estimation and Fourier transform uh, and in fact Laplace transform and many other transforms are based on this particular observation. It's a very important observation and you um, need to understand this. The one thing um, that's uh, that people often ask is how do you derive the Fourier equation of Fourier series or Fourier transform. Well, actually, there's nothing to derive. These are representations. This is, you can sort of think of it as uh, a theory or representation uh, of, 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 uh, of reality, which is complex. So we take a complex signal, something like this, and we say, well, we want to understand this. 
And what Fourier came up is a representation of a complex looking signal um, by its decomposition in just simple sinusoids. And so this whole thing is called, the decomposition is called Fourier analysis. And the synthesis is we just take a bunch of sinusoids and add them together and we get our signal back. So Fourier analysis consists of taking an unknown periodic signal and representing it by a set of harmonic sinusoids that are related to each other by a concept called harmonics. And, and uh, I'll go over that in a moment. Fourier synthesis is just taking those bunch of harmonics, changing their coefficients and sizes, and adding them all together to create a particular uh, periodic wave. So let's take a, um, a uh, continuous time periodic signal. You see that here. It's periodic, as you can see. And, uh, and in fact, I created the signal, so I know what it's composed of. It's composed of three of these sinusoids. There's sinusoid one, and it has an amplitude of two. And then wave number two, which has a frequency uh, of, of two, and it has an amplitude of one. And then wave three, which has an amplitude of point, point 0.5. And if I add these together, I get this periodic wave. Now we can see the same thing in sort of three dimensions. So here's the amplitude, here's time, and you see the sine wave as we were used to looking at them in, in, in uh, uh, the x-axis being the time domain or the time dimension. And then this particular dimension is a frequency dimension. So here's the first uh, signal on at frequency f1, this one's f2, this one's f3. And uh, we add them all together, we get something like this. So this is the 3D picture of uh, what, we're, what we call Fourier analysis. Now this can be very easily turned into a spectrum. What we call, there's two types of spectrums. There's amplitude spectrum and a power spectrum. So let's say we take this, this is our equation. And uh, we see that it consists of three different frequencies. Here's frequency of one, frequency of two, frequency of three. And, uh, and we see that the frequency one has an amplitude of two. So you see this one at frequency one, amplitude of two. Frequency of two hertz, we see an amplitude of one, as I said in the previous uh, chart. And the frequency uh, of three hertz, which is three right there, and it is um, it is um, an amplitude of, uh, I'm sorry, this is the amplitude of 0.5. So this is the amplitude, this is power spectrum. And the way we do power spectrum is uh, pretty easy, and hopefully you know that, and that is that we take the amplitude, which is 2 here, we square it, and then we do its log. So we get 6 dB here, and this is 1, so we get 0 dB, and this is uh, 0.5, so we get minus 6 dB. So this is power spectrum of this signal, and this is the amplitude spectrum of this particular signal. The, in, the, in the frequency domain, then, we would call that the spectrum. Both of these are really spectrums. So this, this whole thing, I keep talking about harmonics. Let me just briefly go over these. The, if you take any arbitrary sine wave, we call an, of any particular frequency, then if we multiply its frequency by, in, by two or double the frequency, that is called the second harmonic of that fundamental or arbitrary sine wave. It doesn't have to be frequency of one or an integer or anything. It can be anything. As long as you multiply it by two, that is its second harmonic. Multiply by three, that is its third harmonic. So fundamental frequency is a fundamental concept in, in free analysis. It is the lowest frequency in the target signal, and we call that the fundamental frequency in the signal. So to do Fourier analysis, you have to know the range of frequencies in a signal and in, particularly, in, in particular the lowest frequency of the signal, which becomes the fundamental frequency for the purposes of Fourier analysis, which means that this, the harmonics are decomposed in integer multiples of, of the frequency of the fundamental. So we often talk about concepts of basis functions. So basis functions, 
are the sinusoids in Fourier analysis. So if something can be represented in terms of something else, then something else is called basic function. So basic functions, uh, if you have a series of numbers such as 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., and 2 is the smallest, then the 2 then becomes the basis function for that particular series. We use harmonic sine and cosines of unit amplitude and zero phase shift to represent arbitrary signals and the frequencies for which we, do, we may or may not know. Fourier series takes a periodic continuous signal and attempts to represent, it guesses in fact, using a bunch of harmonic sines and cosines. So the representation is very, very often is just an estimate. It is usually not able to replicate the, the signal precisely, but good enough for us to understand that signal. <clears throat> Let's uh, take a look at how the signals are, um, the simple sinusoids are represented because I'll be using some of these terms and we want to go over these. So let's take this signal, it's a cosine signal and I have a K here and I'll explain in a moment what that is. So K is the, is the harmonic index, that means if we start with some fundamental frequency, let's say F0 of 2.5, K is the what's what is called the harmonic index. So we would multiply. So the second harmonic for frequency of 2.5 would be 5 hertz, and third would be uh, seven and a half, etc. So as we know that cosines, the the argument of cosines is is a phase. That, so this whole thing is really phase. This part of the uh, phase is function of time, and it's called the instantaneous phase. This part is a fixed number and it is called a phase shift. So we need to understand that this is a phase shift, this is the instantaneous phase. This is changing with time, this does not change with time. The coefficient in the front is the amplitude. And since we are going to use very many different harmonics, this number is different for different harmonics. And in fact, the understanding or calculation of these is what we call Fourier analysis for Fourier series. We can use, you can now see how Fourier uh, harmonics are used to create a particular signal. So here we, we want to create a, a, um, a square wave. So we start out with a, um, a sinusoid then we add another one to it. Here's we added one, another one. Then we add another one. That's three. That's four. So even after adding four harmonics, we're it's looking pretty good. And then here we created another one, but this time starting with sine because you can see that the phase is shifted. Here it's in the middle, and here it's in the at the beginning of the um, our pseudo square wave. So we can create uh, synth by synthesizing all these. Um, harmonics, we can create various different waves. So if you only use cosines in the summation, we get a wave that's even. This is an even wave. If you only use sines, then we get a wave that's odd. Here we've added a bunch of uh, uh, harmonic of sines and cosines. Here is the equation. And you can see that by adding 5, 11, 20, and by the time we've added 20, we've got a pretty good representation of a sawtooth wave. And uh, this little blip here is called the Gibbs phenomena. You can read about it in my book. So the Fourier series equation then is, in a general form, is written like this. The kth harmonic is k times f0. f0 is the fundamental, or what I call the lowest frequency in the signal. The first term right here is, the, is a constant, and it allows us to shift the whole thing um, up and down from the zero axis, or, or often called the DC um, shift. The coefficients a0, ak, bk, these are the amplitudes for the cosine for the kth frequency, and of course they change. So these coefficients are called the Fourier analysis um, coefficients and, and the purpose of Fourier analysis to find what these numbers are.
So there's various different ways that you will see the Fourier series equation in books and literature, etc. So here's one, the one that I gave you previously, and that is a summa the, this is the uh, zeroth frequency coefficient, which is really a DC shift. And AK are the coefficients for all the cosines, BK are the coefficients for sine. Now, another way to write this is to take the the, the frequency and put it in, in this term. And uh, it's pretty simple um, uh, uh, change of variables. We put the period of the signal as 1 over F0. So Fk becomes k over T0, right? Which is because frequency is k times F0. And, and, uh, and, and, we, can, and we can represent F0 in this way. So if we if we put if we change this variable with that, we can write the Fourier series equation in this fashion. Another way of writing it is to to observe that actually sines are just a a, a shifted version of cosine. So actually, we can get rid of this term and we can put in in, in this general form by adding a phase shift. So when we have a sine, we just have a um, put a phase shift and sine becomes a cosine. So this is probably the simplest form of the uh, Fourier series. Now, how do you find these coefficients? They're not really all that hard. And in, 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 uh, I think in um, video one, I've, I go over it. Basically, you multiply uh, the target signal with a cosine and a sine of each of the harmonic uh, uh, frequencies, and then you integrate over one period, and the result comes out to be the coefficients. And here, I give you the equation. Here is the coefficients for the uh, cosines, and just basically you take the signal, multiply it by cosine of a particular harmonic, and then you integrate over the period. And you do the same thing for sine, and it gives you the uh, coefficients for the um, for the for the sine harmonics and the a zero is just the area under uh, the signal over one period. So these three coefficients then will give you the Fourier representation of the signal. And let's take a quick example. Here's a here's a signal, um, and 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 we'll we'll try to find what these uh, coefficients are just by looking at it, and it's surprisingly easy. So um, first thing we notice is that in this signal, the lowest frequency is 3 hertz. So the fundamental is, is 3 hertz. So now we try to find what A0 is. We do not see a, uh, a, uh, a DC shift. So A0 is 0. So here is A0. A1, which is the, co the coefficient of cosine at a frequency of 3 hertz, and we take a look, where, is, where do we find A? Here's cosine, and it has a frequency of 3 hertz. It has a coefficient of 0.3. So A1 is minus 0.3. B1 is 3 hertz, and there's a sine right here. There's a sine at 3 hertz, and its coefficient is 0.8. So B1 is 0.8. Now we have one other frequency, which is, if this is 3, then this is Six. So the, our second coefficient, which is the for the uh, second harmonic, is 0.75, and that's what we have. And this actually is the spectrum for that signal. So Fourier series coefficients are fairly easy if you have the equation. The reverse process is requires some mathematics, but fortunately we have MATLAB and other tools to do that. The coefficients, in fact, when they're plotted like this over the frequency, become spectrum. Now you may say that we have A and B, and that's not how spectrums look like. Well, they don't. And the reason is that when we compute, when we plot the spectrum, we RSS the A and the K. A and the B, I'm sorry. So you take the cosine and the sine coefficients, and you RSS them. And then the same thing as you saw in previous plot, I plot here. And this is a spectrum. And the phase is just, you just take these two, and, and uh, you compute the inverse tan of B, which is the uh, sine 
coefficients of the sine divided by the coefficients of the cosine and the inverse tan, that becomes a phase. And phase looks glitchy and weird and, and it really is hard to understand and, and, and is often ignored. What we actually look at is the magnitude of the harmonics. And, and one thing to keep in mind is that this is true magnitude. This is not relative. It's actually the true magnitude of the harmonics. Here's a picture of power spectrum. Power spectrum is just the uh, square of the amplitude and then usually given in terms of uh, um, uh, logs. So these are all logs. And the frequency is, you start with the fundamental, which is, um, in that case, was 3 hertz. So this would be 3, 6, 9, etc. So the summary is for your series is a way to represent an unknown continuous time periodic signals, very important, periodic signal into certain basis functions. And those basis functions are sines and cosines. The other thing to note is that it is an estimate. The basis functions are harmonic sinusoids. The spectrum of this continuous time periodic signal is discrete which means that the coefficients are only calculated for integer multiples of the lowest frequency or the fundamental frequency in the signal. So to do Fourier series analysis, we need to select a starting frequency, which is called the fundamental frequency. It is the lowest frequency in the target signal. So we compute the coefficients of each harmonic to determine how much of each harmonic is the signal. And given these coefficients, we plot them and voila, that is the spectrum. So now here comes Euler and he says, you know, we can represent cosines and sines by a complex function called complex exponential and it's written like this. Now this is called a positive complex exponential and this is the negative complex exponential. It looks sort of complicated but uh, really, it's just sines and cosines imagined in two dimensions. And here's a picture. So here's a here's the cosine on on this plane. Here's a sine on this plane. And when they're plotted together, they look like actually look like a complex exponential. And it's a helix. It's it, it takes the form of a helix. And as long as the amplitude of these two guys is constant, the amplitude of the helix is also constant and in fact the if if the amplitude of these two were was wearing then we would not have Fourier analysis then we would uh, step into Laplace in Fourier analysis we always assume that the component sinusoids are of constant amplitude the negative um, exponential is just the same thing except here you see this is cosine and this is sine here is the sine is negative right here, sine is negative, and that gives you the same thing except it's rotating in the opposite direction. Now it's just as complex exponential can be represented in forms of these uh, uh, sines and cosines shifted, and the, the J here stands for just a uh, dimension shift. It's the same signal except it's 90 degrees to the cosine. We can represent now an, by taking this equation and, and turning it around, we can now um, represent actually a cosine in form of two complex exponentials. This is adding one half of adding of a positive uh, exponential, and the sine is one half, and then again a j because we want to show that it's in a different dimension. J just tells you that it's in a different different plane. That's all it is. So here's two ways of representing sines and cosines in form of complex exponential. Now the whole thing looks rather confusing and complicated, but it actually makes the math much easier. So in math, we often have to make things at first complicated in order to make them simpler in the long run. Now, we can also represent Fourier series using complex exponentials. So instead of using where we were using pairs of sines and cosines of the same frequency, we use just one, this complex looking function. So this has a frequency of one. So here's one J omega zero T. 
and and it represents this this combination. So each combination is now represented by a complex exponential. Otherwise, the the same same expressions are used, but in form of complex exponential, as as you see here. So this is the original complex. Um, no, uh, the uh, Fourier series equation in form of sines and cosines. And now what we're going to do is put it in form of complex representation. And here, as I said, that these sines and cosines can be written in this form. So what I did is we just replaced this with this form, replaced that with that form. And this is the this is the complex uh, representation of the Fourier series. And the coefficients now become complex, and they are written in this form, and they're called... So now the uh, this is just a, another uh, way of writing it. Instead of writing AK, because this AK changes, because we now have a 2, we, um, we call it by a capital AK and capital BK to say that these numbers are different than than what we get for the uh, for the um, um, for the other uh, for the sinusoid form of uh, uh, a Fourier series and the complex exponentials then give us the complex coefficients for this form of representation. It, 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 it does sound confusing and, and crazy, but I think if you think about it, and actually if you will go back and listen to my uh, video number two, you will understand this better because I'm trying to go through this sort of rapidly. The, so the complex form of the uh, Fourier series is written like this. Here's the F of FT, or the time domain equation of the signal. Here's the way it's written, and here's the way we calculate the coefficients. So here's, we'll take a quick look at it. Here's, here's an equation, and, uh, and we want to find its Fourier series uh, coefficients in form of complex exponentials. That's a little bit different. Um, in uh, when we did sinusoids, we only had positive frequencies. Well, frequencies are still positive here as well. The only thing that really changes is the coefficients. The coefficients span the whole spectrum from minus to, to uh, minus infinity to positive infinity. So because of that, we say that the spectrum, when it's presented in form of the complex exponential has both sides of the uh, the axis, the positive and the negative. And the coefficients actually split in half. It's the same frequency. The frequency didn't change. What changed is the coefficient. So anyway, let me let me go over this. Um, here's uh, here, here's a signal. The the uh, fundamental here is two hertz, and then this is. Uh, another harmonic at uh, two times or second harmonic, and this is a uh, seventh harmonic. We can write this like this. This is the sine, and this is the cosine, and this is the sine again using the complex exponential representation. Now, for the spectrum, we have at uh, two omega zero, which is this one, we have because of this one half factor, we have the full amplitude was one, but we have a half here and a half here, from here and from here, and for k of minus two and a k of plus two. So this is k of plus two and this k of minus two. Notice that omega zero never becomes negative. It is always positive. Frequency is a quantity that's always positive, regardless of what you've heard. The what changes in Fourier analysis is the index. So now let's go to the next one, which is second harmonic or four hertz. So here's a four hertz. It has a coefficient of 0.8, but we split it. We split it with two coefficients: coefficient of four and coefficient of minus four. So half of it, 0.4 is here and 0.4 is here, and the same thing here: 0.15 is here, 0.15 here, and that's seven omega zero. So this is. 
The big difference between complex representation uh, uh, of a Fourier series, the spectrum is double-sided. But it's double-sided because we have coefficients which span both sides of the axis, not because the frequency is negative. So the summary is the complex form of the F FSC or Fourier series equation is simpler to manip manipulate than the trigonometric form. Believe me, this is true. But because it takes a double-sided index to represent a complex exponential, the spectrum of the complex form is two-sided. Okay, does that mean magically we've given birth to negative frequencies? No, there's no such thing as negative frequency. I know that many books talk about it. I, I completely disagree with it, and, and, um, <clears throat> and I hope that you understand why I'm saying that. All right, now I think in my third video, I went over discrete signals. And a discrete signal is basically uh, a continuous signal that has been sampled. And uh, in, 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 in real life, many signals are continuous, but many are discrete. And uh, so we want to know how we are able to do uh, a Fourier analysis on a discrete signal. Now, Nyquist. Um, said that in order to properly represent a continuous signal with discrete sample, you must sample it at least two times its maximum frequency. Because if you don't, you will miss some things. Like for example, we see here, this signal is being sampled, but we've missed all these. So there's no samples at these points. So this, this uh, sampling has not done a very good job. This one is is a, what we would call a faster sampling. You see it has captured most of the points. So unless you will sample a signal at at least two times the maximum frequency in that signal, you will get aliasing. And we don't want that. And the reason why we don't want that is here's a signal and uh, we have sampled it at, at some rate. And here are the samples. If you don't if you don't, if you didn't know what the signal looked like, now all you had was samples. Here's what it would look like: these samples. We can take these samples, and it turns out that we can fit very many signals through these samples. So we are, so there's a big ambiguity as to what these samples actually represent. Mm. So that ambiguity is called uh, sampling. Um, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's called aliasing. aliasing. And uh, um, I. I do go over it in a bit more detail. Actually, on Quora, I have a little tutorial there. And if you can find it, read that, and it will tell you more about al aliasing. So let's take go uh, over the discrete signal again. Here is, a dis here is a signal that has been sampled with a sampling rate of 8 samples per cycle. And here we see a sample version of that signal. There's a concept in analog signals, the concept of frequency is just written like this, sine of omega t. Omega is <clears throat> a certain number of cycles and over time. In discrete signals, it's different. We define something called a discrete frequency. And the discrete frequency is 2 pi divided by the number of samples per period. So for this particular signal, the discrete frequency would be 2 pi divided by 8, because it has 8 samples per period. Discrete form of the FSC. Now remember, we talked about Fourier series for continuous periodic signals. Now we are talking about Fourier series for discrete periodic signals. Still periodic, but discrete. And this has this uh, complex looking uh, equation. Discrete harmonics, now this, this is a very uh, confusing subject, whereas for a continuous signal, we get an unlimited number of harmonics. Let's say you have a signal of 1 hertz, you have 2 hertz, 3 hertz, 4 hertz, 5 hertz, we can have endless number of harmonics uh, by varying the k. But discrete signals are weird, they're just, they're just strange. A discrete signal, if it's been sampled by, let's say, 8 samples uh, per period, it turns out that it only has 
N unique harmonics. That's it. It has only eight, if it's been sampled with a period of eight, then it only has eight harmonics. And this is a fundamental fact that really complicates things for us when we talk about D DTFT and DFT and, F and FFT, which I'll get to later. The a discrete signal <clears throat> so has a double-sided spectrum and has repeating coefficients. So it has uh, <clears throat> this particular signal just... Um, I, I'm not going to go over how, how I computed the spectrum, but the spectrum for this signal is this, and it turns out that this spectrum repeats. So uh, at the moment, you just need to understand that DT signal has a double-sided spectrum, and, and it, it is a repeating uh, spectrum. <coughs> the <coughs> Here's an example. There's a, this is a uh, discrete time signal. It is, uh, it is uh, periodic. As you can see, these uh, pulses are repeating. It has this spectrum, and the spectrum repeats. <clears throat> so Fourier series discussions so far have assumed that the signal of interest is periodic. However, majority of signals that we see are not periodic. Furthermore, that many of the signals that uh, that we get for analysis, such as, say, voice signal, like, for example, me talking if it was um, um, sampled, would appear to be random bits with no, there would be, uh, appear to be no period, 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 periodicity, uh, except the fact that possibly that I'm coughing every now and then. So Fourier series comes up short for these types of signals, and this was something that was noticed right away by contemporaries of uh, Fourier and, uh, and and he was criticized. He said that uh, why his uh, wonderful representation did not cover a periodic signal. So being a good mathematician, he went off and worked for well, a good 20 years and came up with what we call now Fourier transform. So you, you see, if it took him 20 years, it's you know, it's it's okay if we don't understand it the first time we read it. Um, <clears throat> it it does require going over the subject a few times before it sinks in. Although once you understand it, it's just crystal clear and and, and is indeed very easy um, to to understand and to apply to complex situations. So once again, Fourier series applies to con applies well continuous and per and discrete signals, and the spectrum for a continuous periodic signal computed by the Fourier series is discrete and is single sided, as I showed you. Continuous periodic complex version is also discrete, but is has a two sided spectrum. Discrete periodic signals have a discrete and repeating spectrum, and it has only K0, or K, with K0 being the number of samples per period, it only has K0 harmonics, unlike the continuous periodic signals, which can have unlimited or uh, infinite harmonics. So the question is what to do if the signal is not periodic? We cannot use Fourier series. So can we compute the Fourier series coefficient of a signal like this? It's not periodic. There's, we don't know what's out here. It's considered not periodic or aperiodic. So here's what we do. If it were periodic, it would be something like this, and it would have a period. Let's say it has a period of five uh, seconds. But 5 is, I just picked that as sort of a random arbitrary number. What if it was 10? The signal would look like this. Well, what if it was 15? It would look like that. What if it was 50? It would look like that. Well, we can keep going with this idea and say that the period is, in fact, infinity. There are other copies of the signal, but they're so far that they don't matter. 
So in Fourier series equation, where we had an actual finite period, for the purposes of Fourier transform, the period is now infinite. So this is how we convert Fourier series of periodic signals to Fourier transform, where the signal is aperiodic, and we do that by assuming that the period has gone to infinity. I'm now going to switch uh, to more detailed math to show you how we actually develop the Fourier transform from Fourier series equation.